We have Dar- <laughs> Uh oh, you guys okay? Babble just dropped the audio. <laughs> Darlene, Cavalier, welcome. Hey ladies, what's going on? How are you? Hey. <laughs> nice to see you. My you are too proud to shiny for the morning. It looks... <laughs> Wait. You guys look like you're having fun over there. <laughs> we are, we are. <laughs> Yeah, Although I just not... learned, if you try and record a video through Google Glass, through the viewfinder of your camera, it will make you motion sick. So don't do that. <laughs> not looking forward to trying that. I like that little bear back there. Yes, this is the bear of charging. Um, his head is precisely sized that when you need to put your Google Glass somewhere safe to charge it, um, they fit his head perfectly. Oh, so he's the bear of charging. He's perfect. You you might hear, let's see, uh, my son just woke up and he's discovered that I'm upstairs. Teddy, I'm upstairs on a Google Hangout. You want to see? All right, so that's what, that, that's what the background noise is. And I should warn you, there are there are four of them. That's the first to wake up. Um, but you guys don't mind. Look at, look at your space. You're used to chaos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so... Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you do so much to help our community grow from SciStarter, which lists out all of the great programs out there, to Science Cheerleaders that shows that uh, science nerds come in all shapes, sizes, and uh, levels of, I don't know how to put it, I guess trendiness in uh, is one way to put it. Sure. Um, yeah, so, so you describe it because I'm stumbling. Okay, no problem. So the, the two uh, sites that you just mentioned, um, I'll start with Science Cheerleader because that's the craziest of them and sometimes takes a little bit longer to explain. It's basically uh, current and former NFL and NBA cheerleaders who are also scientists and engineers, which is still surprising to me and I shouldn't be so surprised because I used to cheer for the Philadelphia 76ers which is an NBA team here in Philly, go Philly, but I am the only science cheerleader who does not have a formal science degree. So this organization started as a blog I was writing, um, very boring story, but basically advocating for the reopening of a congressional agency that you all might have enjoyed um, had they still been around because I think they would have really wanted to continue supporting a lot of the work that you're doing, but it's called the Office of Technology Assessment. And they worked for Congress and they provided technology assessment input for Congress at the request of Congress. Um, but they were defunded, zeroed out um, by Newt Gingrich um, in 1994 or 1995. So this blog started when I was in graduate school at Penn writing um, to advocate for the reopening of this um, agency, but with an important distinction. The original legislative language for the Office of Technology Assessment called for citizen input to be included in the um, reports to Congress. It never happened uh, for a variety of reasons. So when I was advocating for this, it was really with the emphasis on the public participation as a way to complement the expert analysis that was delivered to Congress. Um, so just as I was playing around with at this time I wasn't playing around with stereotypes, I was just saying like, hey, regular people should and will be involved in these conversations, we just need a mechanism. It really came down to the mechanism, how do we make that happen, physically make that happen. Um, but I was still getting pushback, especially in the Beltway, especially I should add in the professional science associations with um, the idea of public input. Because the fear was that it would be a crazy town hall session and kind of the loudest nuttiest people would you know be able to supersede what the experts were saying and that's really not what I was advocating for um, so I, in my quest pun intended to say um, you know regular people from all walks of life have some value to add to conversations um, I started highlighting the science cheerleaders to say look at first blush depends on what you think of a cheerleader but if you spend a little time getting to know people you would learn that they also have advanced degrees many of them in STEM fields. Yeah. I, I really had no idea <laughs> that it would basically take over my life. I found one or two and I thought it would be an interesting story. We're up to 250 and counting now, active science cheerleaders from all across the country. Um, and now they've ended up being one of the most important outreach and marketing and activation tools that I have for the other site. So in short, science cheerleaders are current and former NFL and NBA cheerleaders who are also scientists and engineers. And the whole tagline is basically they help 
challenge stereotypes. Um, I did not think I would be doing advocacy work for cheerleaders, to be honest with you, but as it turns out, there's a lot of stereotypes placed on cheerleaders as well, especially oh, young yeah. cheerleaders. And they tend to, um, you know, without more guidance, some young cheerleaders are prone to uh, fit those stereotypes instead of being really comfortable that they're also smart and they're also interested in science and math and engineering and technology. So the science cheerleaders really help them feel comfortable bridging those two worlds and saying, no, 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 no. All those things that make you a good cheerleader, you know, your your devotion, your commitment to time, time management skills, yeah. um, your ability to work together as a team, optimism, all those things can work for you in the lab. They can make you a better scientist. They can make you a better engineer. So this is one thing that the science cheerleaders do with young cheerleaders in particular. We have a national partnership with the Pop Warner organization. So we work with their 100,000 little cheerleaders to spread this message. Wow. They, and they talk to them about their, their own individual careers. You know, hey, here's what it means to be a biomedical engineer. Um, but they also get people involved. Every public appearance they do or media interview they do, they shine a light on a citizen science project taking place in that neighborhood. We look for local projects to help those researchers in need of help to really connect to his or her community. Um, we also do national projects and for the first time we are running our own citizen science project. The science cheerleaders are principal investigators of a research project that we're doing right now to collect 4,000 samples of microbes from shoes and cell phones and also from heavily populated venues like, not coincidentally, NFL and NBA stadiums. So. It's kind of this crazy. This is the most awesome but gross <laughs> citizen oh, science I project. It. I heard you talk it's, about this at NSTA, and, and I want to hear more. I want everyone to hear more. Oh, that's right. You were there. I was, yeah. It was nice to see your beautiful hair in there, brightening up the whole. There it is. <laughs> Love it. I told you my daughter My daughter had, a, I think, manic panic was her yeah, color yeah, of choice yeah. for a little while. Um, she'll be the next one awake. Actually, she'll be the last one awake as a 15-year-old girl. Um, but so this is a citizen science project, and this is where we um, move over to that second site, SciStarter, S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R. And SciStarter aggregates, um, but we have, we have well over 600 citizen science, active citizen science projects now. And it's a, it's a free tool. We um, help researchers connect to the public, and the real goal is to help the public learn about and get involved in projects of interest to them. So these are searchable using intuitive terms that regular people would use like hey show me something I could do at the beach with kids in under a half hour in, along the Jersey Shore and it would be great if it's free so we use those types of search terms um, and of course you can drill down and be very specific about what you're looking for you know you want to learn about the ruby-throated hummingbird bird believe me there's projects for that there's a project for everything this particular project that we're working on it's SciStarter, Science Cheerleader, and UC Davis. Um, we collect microbes. We collect them from shoes and cell phones. We, we really ask the public to collect their own microbes at large events. So um, let's use the Phillies game, for example. We were on the concourse of the Phillies game, and we collected well over 500 samples. So we had 500 participants there who said, yeah, this sounds pretty cool. This is kind of crazy. What are you doing? Well, we're comparing microbes on Earth to microbes on the International Space Station. And then we, so we, we do all the sequencing. Actually, Argon Lab does all the sequencing. We share all the results. It's all open. So everybody who participates um, gets to see what we found um, in, in patterns. So for IRB reasons, I can't say, hey, Pamela, uh-oh, look what I found on your shoe, and here's what I found on your cell phone. Better see a doctor. We can't do any of that. We just say, hey, of all the shoe samples that were taken on this day at this location, here's the sequence of patterns that we found. And it's a heat map. So you can kind of make sense of what we're finding. And then you can play around with the variables. So you can start to say, well, whatever that yellow thing represents, it seems like there's a lot in Philly. And wow, there's a lot on the space station. Let's learn more about that yellow microbe. Let's see what that means. Um, and then we send 40 samples to the International Space Station. And this will take place. It was supposed to happen in uh, November. It's been pushed to January. So in January, these are sent, you know, as part of the payload. They're sent to the International Space Station. And then also the astronauts there will be collecting samples on the International Space Station. So we get a, a snapshot of the type of microbes that exist there. But these 40 samples, half will be sent there, half are kept at UC Davis. And there's a growth rate analysis that happens. And I'm very excited to see who wins the microbial 
Super Bowl race that we're going to have because we're getting samples from the Ravens and the 49ers stadiums to do a rematch of the Super Bowl. But uh -oh. using the micro Can I just it. say that the winner's the one that grows slower? Because that's the one that I'd rather have around. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes. Obviously, you know more about microbes than the average person, like me. I'm like, oh, which one's going to grow really fast? It's interesting even how they're selecting which microbes go up there. I'm, I'm curious to learn more about that process from UC Davis, too. They're working with a, a classroom through the Jet Propulsion Lab, too, to kind of um, decide on some of the microbes that are sent up. So I don't know what's going up. It will be interesting, though. It's been a great program. So that's a, another ex example of a citizen science project. Um, because that requires physical labor, I mean, you have, you have to distribute these kits. And we, we know how low, low key these kits are. It's just Q-tips and barcodes and Ziploc bags. Um, but it's much more effective to have people out there. So we have these 250 you know, science cheerleaders as ambassadors to the project that are out there, they're talking about the project to people, they're talking about the scientific merit, they're reminding people that we're not just asking to collect microbes from them, we're asking them to keep, you know, keep, in, keep themselves informed of what we're finding. And then that maybe draw upon their own conclusions. They can mash that data up with other points of data that they're finding. Um, so we want to keep them engaged as long as we can. Uh, the, the funny thing I want to mention is that with the Orlando Magic game, that we have a science cheerleader there who sent us pictures that are Priceless. I'll email them to you if I, or I'll definitely email them to you. I wish I could pull them up. I'm not sure how, but it's basically her after she cheered at a game. She's there on the court with her rubber gloves and collecting samples from the court and from the seats and from some of the um, communications devices that are there. And it's, I love that symbolism. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about this too. No, no. It's so, so part of me is enthralled and part of me is horrified. Um, just, just because I know <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it, we are surrounded by germs and, and we are actually better off in terms of not breeding the superbug by not trying to annihilate all of them with bleach and antibacterials. Yeah. But while I, I am at peace with the fact that I live in a world surrounded by microbes and I use regular soap rather than antibacterials, um, I, I still don't feel the need to have a deep understanding of the creepy crawlies that occupy well, the they, places they I occupy. They outnumber your the cells of I your know, body. I know. I know. They I know. outnumber you ten to one. The, this is where the enthralled and horrified <laughs> yes. simultaneously oh. overlay one another in my mind. So I left out an important part of this research too. So this is done through Jonathan Eisen's lab, right? The Eisen lab at UC Davis, yeah. whose work is is very focused on microbes in the built environment. So one of the things that this research aims to do is to get a better snapshot of the type of microbes that lurk in buildings. So we know a lot about, we know a fair amount about what's on our bodies, what's in the air, but in we, we spend our lives in buildings. <clears throat> and so one of the things this looks at is, all right, we get a snapshot, maybe it'll tell us something about city to city, different microbes that exist in those buildings. But it's more, what happens to these microbes in large, heavily populated venues like these stadiums, as opposed to the extremely tightly controlled venue building of the International Space Station. That's of great interest to UC Davis and Jonathan's lab in particular. Um, so it's, it's kind of less about the creepy crawly thing and more about the behavior of microbes when you change these environments. Yeah, and, and like one of the things I'd love to do is find someone who does this type of research and I, I know each of us hosts our own microbial populations um, and quite often the microbial populations over time will merge between spouses and communities and there's a certain amount of geolocation that you can do based on the microbial population on a body. Well those of us who are frequent travelers, uh, the question has arisen do you see a greater cross-contamination? Are we basically super breeding grounds for all of these bugs as we bring microbes from one place into another? Um, this, this is a research idea I heard at Science Online. And uh, as a frequent traveler, I really don't want to become ground zero for the next microbe. There's two quick follow-up points to that, and one goes right to the heart of CosmoQuest and just added value for the work that you're already doing and other ways it could be leveraged. So, well, let me get to that first. Um, there's 
so much data that's being collected now. So this gets sequenced at Argonne through Jack Gilbert's lab, right? And he's um, really contributing to this world microbe map. Uh, map sorry. Um, but wouldn't it be great to kind of uh, recalibrate in some ways, definitely leverage the work that you've already done to allow the public to then go in and start to classify and make sense of some of these patterns that are being developed there. And it's something I definitely want to follow up with you about. I know I saw some email exchanges between you and Jonathan, but it sure seems like a great platform. You know, it's, it's been used for the space purposes of it. There's no reason yeah. why it can't be repurposed for the microbes. And, and, and this is one of those things where we purposely built all of our stuff to be as flexible as, as possible. And, and we'd be more than thrilled to open a, a sister to CosmoQuest that may be BioQuest or ChemQuest. Yes. Um, what we love ahead. about your work is your community building aspect of it. So it's, it's not just, hey, go to this website, mm -hmm. click yeah. through, and you know, help our researchers. It's not very fulfilling, and there's a certain amount of there's a certain segment of the population that that's that's perfect for, and we see that because we see popular platforms that are set up to do that. This just just knowing that we started this as face to face communication with these volunteers who want to learn more, they are so well primed to be part of a community, and that requires effort. It requires nurturing. It requires a sustained effort to nurture that community and you guys do that so well I definitely want to figure out a way to well, tap your thank, talents thank you so much and I you know I have to admit you've solved some problems for us because one of the things that we had on our to-do list when we launched CosmoQuest was we wanted to create a citizen science wiki a place where people could go share information about citizen science projects and we realized that was going to be a bear because we were going to end up having to, to create most of it ourselves and so that link on our website never got populated and then size starter just grew and grew and grew and we realized we have no need to be redundant with the things that you do um, and and so we're going to be linking out to you in uh, the I think it's going to actually end up going live tomorrow oh, uh, your link we're going to try and get the new version of the site uh, live at the end of the day but I haven't been able to go in and edit the navigation bars Pretty to add it in. Fire with CSS is Joe Walton. Yeah, so you're going to be listed up in the top oh, cool. bar of our navigation uh, under resources. Great. Um, and and it's we know that people who come to us sometimes they bring their spouse who really is just kind of done. Yeah, I know you like astronomy. <laughs> yes. But, and there's so much more, and there's so much science that needs done. If astronomy isn't your thing, fine. Go find other science to do. Yeah. Uh, just do something. Yes, but again, your ability to nurture these communities and the effort that you've done. I can't say enough about your work. I say to other people, direct people over to your site, but it's really unique. Your approach is so holistic and Thank genuine so much. that uh, it, needs, it needs to stay around. We need support for this. So we, we are a community. We, we all fill different niches and and what I see with what you do is you're the ones out there helping. You're the information hub that helps people find the places to go. We, we are someplace that we build community, we build the software, we build the technologies that allow the, the community to grow. And we look for the scientists with the questions and we consume them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we do their science for them and they publish yeah. the papers. Even the ones that have like 77 pages is the one that we just wow. submitted. It was huge. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, That's remarkable. <laughs> and, and so uh, we, we all do things together. We had Global astro uh, Astronomers Without Borders on earlier. Uh, they're the ones who are out there on the ground in the developing world helping to bring people um, into this global community, giving them the leg up to get online and get engaged. And uh, we, all, we all do this together, and CosmoQuest is very proud to be one of the nexuses that helps bring these communities together. And uh, your, your donations, those of you out there, will help us keep this going and help us uh, continue to be able to work with programs, uh, hopefully branching into new fields over time, as, as Darlene's suggesting. That's definitely something that we want to do. And there's a need for it, so go CosmoQuest. <laughs>
<laughs> so this this is this is really awesome. Now I have to ask, do you happen to have any Oreo cookies around? Not up here. Uh, I probably have leftover crumbs of Oreo cookies on the ground, but not right so, now. So we're getting ready to do an Oreo cookie geology demonstration. I'm having oh, man. See, I, I, I hear her sitting beside me, crinkle, 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 <laughs> crinkle. I saw that. The boys stopped feeding us hours ago. The boys went to bed hours ago. Tim hasn't. Okay. <laughs> My boy went to sleep hours ago. That? Have you slept? Nope. Man. And uh, yeah, Tim, Tim Legato, my boyfriend, has not slept either. <laughs> oh my God. He's been running stuff in the background. Okay. Great. So we have okay. no scissors. <laughs> no, that's why I poked it with the pin. <laughs> oh! Hang on. My, oh, speaking of sleep, my, my alarm's going off. It's one of those newfangled peel back. A majiggy oh, thing. oh, that shows you are definitely, you have not eaten Oreos in a while. No, I oh, have. <laughs> it's not so new. <laughs> I try really hard not to buy cookies except for Girl Scout cookies because <laughs> I just can't be trusted. Oh, yeah, we've got, a, we've got all flavors here. It comes in birthday, birthday cake filling now, double stuff, you name it. Yes. See, you you have you and four children yes. and anyone else who comes into the house. I have me and my husband, and if I, yeah, both of us are fully capable of destroying an entire box. So uh, it was known that I was welcomed into Tim's family uh, when I was on family vacation, and I pulled out the double stuff Oreos, and I opened two Oreos and smushed the cream side of two together to make a quadruple stuffed Oreo. <laughs> And Tim's cousin looks at me and goes, oh, yeah, you're one Sold. of us. <laughs> so. I was accepted. Okay. All right. So this is something that you can do with your kids then. And my mic is having issues. Um, let me see if I can get gravity assist to help keep it up. Whoa, except there's a monitor in the way. Apparently, I lose my ability to use, geom to use geometry with microphones at a certain point. Okay. So the neat thing about Oreo cookies is they have multiple layers, and one layer can slide across the other. And this is kind of what crustal plates do as they float over the mantle. And there's a fancy word for what the white filling is currently representing, and I have to look at the word. It's the asthenosphere, and I'm sure I mispronounced it. So the first thing you can, te you can teach is the way the crust slides over the soft, squishy stuff underneath. Now when the soft, squishy stuff escapes, um, we call that magma, lava, basalt once it cools magma. off. And, and so now I have an upwelling of magma <laughs> beside my crust. Now I'm going to eat this one. <laughs> We're just making a mess. <laughs> We're also doing this with a shoebox and paper. Cheapest demo you can imagine um, for the CosmoQuest Teacher Professional Development Workshop uh, all next week. So we'll have to do. I think actually we have a, a that look back in the learning. Uh, no, actually not learning space. One of our special event hangouts um, where Kathy actually does that demo for us. So the next thing you can do is divergent plate boundaries. What I did was I popped the top off, I snapped it so that there's two pieces, because the Earth's crust does that sometimes. It'll break in places. Currently, it's breaking in Ethiopia. Hmm. And what you can get is the two crustal layers diverging apart. Where they diverge, you get the magma welling up. And you end up with new land forming, or uh, well, it'll form at the bottom of an ocean, um, and you get an ocean filling in between the floating crusts. So currently, a new ocean is in the process of forming in the Ethiopian Rift. So right. that's a divergent crustal boundary that I'm now going to eat. <laughs> now, don't try and eat magma or rocks. I think that goes without saying. Don't choke, please. <laughs> Don't make me do the Heimlich on air. <laughs> so 
So we don't, okay. you, don't, you don't need eye goggles or, or any gloves for this. That's right. It looks safe. Completely it's, safe demo. It's the four cookie demo. <gasps> so this next one is much better done with uh, double stuff, which we don't have. We have single stuff. And I'm losing it as well. Okay, this cookie is getting rejected. Reject. Okay, you can eat the reject cookie. <laughs> okay, so I'm again taking the top off of the cookie. I'm going to break it in half. Now this time I'm teaching convergent plate boundaries. So when you have convergent, this is where one goes up and the other dives underneath. And where this happens, you often can get volcanoes. This is happening all along the Pacific Rim over um, in the Indonesia and Philippines region. So one plate is diving under the other plate. This leads to lots of earthquake activities, uh, volcanism, um, and in this case, island chains. Hmm. So I'm going to wait to eat that one because Nicole will make me laugh and try and kill me on air. <laughs> So the last type of plate boundary that I'm going to teach with an Oreo cookie is the, I'm at the point in the day where I have to get my vocabulary words out of my notes. I always have to do that. This is the transform plate boundary. This is what's going on along the San Andreas Fault in California. So you have two plates that are trying to move parallel to one another, but their edges are rubbing. When you try and do this with the cookie, you'll realize it really doesn't like rubbing against each other and you end up with little bits of cookie all over the carpet. Mm. Um, when this happens in California, instead of ending up with little bits of cookie all over California, you instead end up with massive earthquakes. And uh, in the case of the 1908 San Francisco earthquake, horrible destruction. And this is because the earth will try and move the plate, try and move the plate, and then all of a sudden the frictional forces will give way. It will go from static friction to kinetic friction. And as the plate boundaries slip, um, you can end up with movements of several meters. And uh, when your planet suddenly moves a chunk of the planet several meters, bad things happen. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I can eat the cookie. That's right. Happy ending. Do you, do you want to do your phases of the moon Oreo demo? That's not mine. I don't know it. You don't know that one? No. Oh, it's very simple. Okay, I'm going to wait to consume cookies because I'm just going to create a pile of them here in front of me. So here we have the full moon. It's called the full moon because the half of the moon that we see is entirely illuminated. Now the moon's a sphere. So it's not that the entire moon is illuminated. It's just that the half we see is illuminated. So that means that if I eat off half the frosting, it's a delicious demo. <laughs> this is not called a half moon. This is called a quarter moon because we're seeing one-fourth of a round object that's illuminated. And that dark side of the moon half of it's currently illuminated too. So if we see half illuminated, it's really only a quarter of the moon. Uh -huh. The other part of the half that's illuminated, that's the other quarter on the dark side. Mm -hmm. So when we call it the dark side, it's just dark in our understanding, but even that's been fixed because we now send things orbiting around the moon. Uh -huh. Anyways, the side of the moon that has the frosting, this is the side where the sun is. So if I see the sun setting, I know that the edge of the moon closest to the horizon is falling behind. Now mm -hmm. if the moon's going to set before the sun, the side with the frosting, it's the other side, it uh. sets first. So the frosting is always facing mm -hmm. the sun. And as the frosting disappears, that's because more and more of the dark side is getting covered in frosting. That's the lunar phases. Pretty cool. We have a question um, from Will Selwood. As a software developer by day and noob amateur astronomer in the cloudy United Kingdom, do you guys know of any open source software projects with an astronomical focus that people can get involved with? Is there a way to filter SciStarter for something along those lines? That is a great question. We have not done that, but it would not be difficult for us to do that. Um, 
We're about, we're right now compiling some uh, key questions that we want to ask all the project organizers who have submitted their projects to SciStarter. And that could be one that we add to it if awesome. their project is open source and something more about their platforms and, and the softwares that they're using. The software and using. and in this case, that. I'd give the specific advice of go to unmanned space flight. There's always people who are working together to create open source image processing software. There's also a suggestion to check out Stellarium.org because they're it's another open, open source project. Well. It's yeah, open source planetarium software. Um, so that's that's hey, that's a great great point. His name was Will. Thanks, yeah. Will. Will Selwood. He's in the Google main event page Hangoutathon <laughs> comments. So thank you for that. Uh, and and uh, Dusty is saying it seems like this is a good way to torture children to eat Oreos in front of them. <laughs> Since Pamela's already decided not to babysit your children if you give a hundred thousand dollars, because all she'll do is eat Oreos in front of them. You guys are awesome. We have so many different demos involving food, yes. and one of the things that we do is we make small children smell like brownies. Ooh. <laughs> it's true. Do you Not an to... edible de demo in its own right, uh, but yes, the, co the flour and cocoa powder, uh, I wouldn't want to sit there and eat it, but it does make everything smell like brownies, and we, we use that to model uh, the lunar surface or any other planetary surface where that gets hit by a crater. And so we throw marbles at it, and oh, uh, the layer of cocoa powder over the flour um, it, it allows you to see the underlying um, the, <laughs> the underlying <laughs> minerals Thanks. or flour um, that is uh, exposed during an impact event. And, cool. and you can do some of this with Oreo cookies as well. Um, they start out with nice solid surfaces and so you can array a level of them in a pan with walls so that you don't end up with cookies everywhere. And then you drop stale gumballs, which are nice and hard, onto them. And it causes the surfaces to fracture and get dustier and dustier. And this is kind of what the lunar regolith has exper experienced. Now, this is a demo that's actually better done with multiple layers of graham crackers, but I like Oreos better. They taste better. Doing the graham cracker one with stale donuts also at the professional development. We have a lot of edible demos going into our professional development for but, teachers. But I notice. The uh, marketing side of me is noticing just one brand name sticking out. I think I think Oreo owes you some money here. I think they, I, you know uh, what is this? Which Nabisco? company is the parent company? That's what, yeah, it's Nabisco. So Nabisco, Nabisco. If you want to sponsor us, we'll 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 take like. Food for our teacher demos and to feed our teachers. And our grad students. Yes, <laughs> we do need to feed Joe. Yes, and and their maybe commercial they can have is like play with your food. There you go. We're there in the go. process. Edible right. science. I love it. Great. You have to get your science everywhere you can find it, and oh. uh, we we look for it in in our cho chocolatey goodness as well. And uh, any of you who've been watching long enough have noticed that we did space out a couple of different um, completely edible things. The only sadness was our our astronomy breakfast stuff. Uh, Rebecca was the one who got to eat all of that. Yeah, yeah, that didn't happen here. <laughs> they looked good, though. They looked good, the astronomy pen. Do you so, have caffeine, so with caffeine experiments? How are you staying awake? I'm not. My body's just moving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not actually awake. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think part of it is my normal sleep schedule is I go to bed around 3 or 4 in the morning, so I'm not up that far past my bedtime. Okay. Um, but you got up earlier than you usually do. I did get up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and you clearly have been working on this a, a while. I mean, it's so well organized. Really great job. Thank you so much for saying that. It's, it's not true. <laughs> It, it appears from where I'm sitting in Philadelphia to be extremely well organized. We are org we are organized quickly. Is what yeah. We do. So so <laughs> it, this this was really a matter of we ha we had to go through the uh, make sure that we had the clearance from the university to do this before we did it, um, and then. It, because we have to spend our work hours working on our work that we're paid to do. This isn't part of what we're paid to do. That's the irony of being a scientist. You don't get paid to spend the time you have to spend to get paid. So grant writing and things like that all have to happen outside of work hours. Mm -hmm. 
And so we organized this in our spare time. Uh, Nicole went to AAS. I went to Balticon. Um, we both had to go fly and get glass. Uh, there was no had to involved. We both decided to become uh, glass explorers. Mm -hmm. um, and so we put this together in our spare time, and we got a ton of help. And yeah, the fact that, that it seems organized is thanks to the uh, people running the green room and the people running everything in the background and the people mm -hmm. who have been putting video together for us. So Richard and Ray and Tim and Mike. Yeah. And yeah, so we, seen somebody, I'm sure. we put together an entire list of people to contact on May 31st. And I think I contacted you on Wednesday because your name had ended up just Psy Starter. It was at the bottom of the list. And so it just took us a while to contact everybody. Yeah. Um, great. So, yeah, well, it's... I'm happy to have the opportunity to participate. Thank you for inviting me also. And um, I'll go link to your page to make a donation. And I'm happy to oh, support Oh, thank you it. so much. Sure, I'm happy to. And let's and, uh, the dialogue to figure out a way to uh, repurpose your platform um, for other scientists, too. We, we need to Even for keep, icky science. Yeah, even for icky science. Like I said, I, it's the dichotomy of, of it, enthralled and grossed out. Um, so, yeah, let's definitely find ways to make that happen. And uh, if I have to fly somewhere to sweet talk the scientist, I'm always willing. This is what frequent flyer miles were made for. Yeah, and you know, Sacramento is not a bad place to be. That's where we'll uh, visit Jonathan. I, I have a good friend in Sacramento whose house I'm pretty sure I could crash at, so that makes the, che the trip even cheaper. Awesome. All right, ladies. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Oh, sure, my pleasure. Caffe caffeinate. We, we will, and we now have the sugar and chocolate to yeah. go with it. <laughs> yes. And uh, I'm, thank your children for us for staying quiet so that you could do this on a Sunday morning and on Father's Day, no less. Oh, oh, believe me. I think they're happy to hear that their mom is distracted. God knows what they're doing downstairs. They're way too quiet. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining right. us. Take care. And in, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank it's you, too. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>